Trump's promise to exact retribution and revenge upon a possible return to the White House is not normal political speech either. And yet it has become the central tenet of his third presidential bid. Joining me now, Steve Bennon, producer for The Rachel Maddow Show and MSNBC political contributor, also author of the book The Imposters, How Republicans Quit Governing and Seized American Politics. Also with us is Molly Jong Fast, special correspondent for Vanity Fair, host of the Fast Politics podcast and an MSNBC political analyst. Good morning to both of you. Molly, I guess we're trying to figure out, because we've always tried to figure out with Donald Trump, he steps away from normalcy, he goes farther than anyone else does, and we wonder what that's supposed to mean. And some people have become numb to it. It's just Donald Trump doing what Donald Trump does. Does it bother you? Does, does anything about the way he talks now, the physical mocking, the, the, the crudeness, the language he uses about immigrants, the, the discussions he has about bloodbaths, does, does any of this trouble you more than normal, or are you troubled the same? The scariest part of Donald Trump's rhetoric now is that he wants to root out enemies that are domestic. So for a long time, he focused on lies about people from Mexico and lies about, you know, immigrants and immigrant children. By the way, he did a long tangent last night about immigrant children not speaking English. Well, he was slurring, which is both ironic and also awful. Um, but the thing that strikes me as the scariest is the part of his plan where he's going to go after domestic enemies. That is totally new. It reminds me of the very scary McCarthy stuff in the 50s, and it could really open the door to some really terrifying stuff for, for all of us. I'm going to uh, send you and, and Steve some links to properties that I've been looking at in Toronto. Uh, Steve Bannon, let's talk about some of the language as it relates to, to immigrants. Um, just this week, I'm going to be talking to a, a member of Congress shortly, but just this week, Democrats helped keep Mike Johnson in his spot um, to avoid sort of more chaos in Congress. And Mike Johnson immediately started talking about a bill to make it illegal for undocumented uh, immigrants to vote prior to citizenship. I don't know about you, Steve, but I, I always assumed it was illegal for undocumented immigrants who are not citizens of this country to vote. So the, the, the red meat continues uh, all the way down to Mike Johnson, whom Democrats just saved. Right. And did you, did you notice, Ali, what he said during that, those remarks on Capitol Hill? He was saying that in his mind, that intuitively, he knows that there are lots of anti, uh, illegal immigrants voting in, in elections. Intuitively. As if Intuitively. You know, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't pay attention to what actually happens, and we shouldn't take, pay attention to election data and all the various resources that are available to us. We should just intuitively understand that right-wing talking points are true, which is absurd. It happened the same week that Donald Trump said that when it comes to election results, we should follow our hearts, not, our, not election results. <laughs> we should just believe what we want to believe. It reminded me a lot of Stephen Colbert's old Comedy Central character where he talked about truthiness. We shouldn't pay attention to what's true. We should pay attention to what we want to believe to be true. And now we have, instead of a comedic character, we have the Speaker of the House and the presumptive Republican Party presidential nominee embracing those same tactics and presenting them to the public as if they were legitimate. Right. Molly, uh, the, the trial, the Trump trial last week was was compelling. Stormy Daniels was on the stand. She yeah. made for a compelling and, and relatively relaxed seeming uh, witness in that kind of environment because she has been one of those people who's been subject to scorn um, and, and, and derision by Donald Trump. But if you liked what you saw last week, this week is going to be much hotter. Michael Cohen, who is now, you know, he was fixer and now arch nemesis, is set to testify for several days beginning tomorrow. This is going to get very hot because Trump's folks are all there to discredit uh, Michael Cohen, to say that he is an admitted liar. Uh, the prosecution has to prove that whatever you think of, Don, uh, of Michael Cohen, he's got literally receipts. One of the things that they've done that I think has been very smart in this trial is they started the trial with David Pecker. And David Pecker did not have an ax to grind with Donald Trump. He's still good friends with Donald Trump. And he really set the table for this case. He showed that this was a catch and kill, that this was something they did, that he even knew it was maybe a campaign finance violation because he had talked to his in-house lawyer. I mean, it was just one of these really good examples of how Donald Trump has a very sort of emotional way of dealing with this trial. You know, candidate Trump and defendant Trump are often at odds. And so what you saw with Pecker was that his his people didn't go that hard on Pecker because Pecker's his friend. 
But Pecker really had him in a lot of these facts kind of dead to rights. So now we had uh, Stormy Daniels last week. Stormy Daniels, again, did not, you know, it didn't matter if there was sex, right? That wasn't part of the case. But because Trump's people went so hard on this whole you're lying thing, it ended up being part of the case. And I think that was really unhelpful for Trump, too. Uh, for me, as a feminist, what made me the most upset about the Stormy Daniels situation was they just were so hard on her and, and in a really kind of misogynistic way. Now we'll have Michael Cohen. Again, this case, I think, has gone, has gone worse for Trump because Trump has been involved in sort of pushing his lawyers to do his bidding. I think that's a very likely scenario. Which, by the way, is how this goes in the Supreme Court. It's, it's one of those situations where it's like, are the, the lawyers who know the law in charge of this, or are they just trying to figure out ways to get Donald Trump's not legal arguments into a legal setting? Steve, uh, this mm -hmm. trial comes at a time when the, the, polling does indicate that this election is very close. Now, look, some people pay much more attention to actual polls mm -hmm. than I do. I, I pay attention to trend lines uh, more than the actual poll, but 538 at the beginning of May said fewer than one percentage point separated Biden and Trump. At the same time four years ago, Biden was up six points. Um, what's your takeaway from sort of the world we're in, the world Donald Trump is in, and the upcoming election? Right. Well, there's good news and bad news for people, no matter what your perspective. I mean, if you're looking at this from the perspective of someone who wants to see President Biden win a second term and see Donald Trump lose, you can take some solace in the fact that this polls have been incredibly steady for months. Donald Trump has a very narrow lead. We're looking at possibly less than one percentage point when you average the polls together. And, then, and with six months to go, that's, it's very easy to imagine the, president, the incumbent president being able to overcome that margin. It's really, we're talking about half a percentage point. But when you compare it against where we were four years ago, the picture is much brighter for Republicans. Donald Trump trailed Joe Biden in head to head matchups every month, every week, every day throughout all of 2020. That we're not seeing that right now, and so from the perspective of a Democrat who wants to see them see Biden win and Trump lose, it tells us that it tells us that that party has a lot of work to do be between now and November. And if you're a Republican, you have reason to be, believe that you're in a better position than you were four years ago. But at the same time, threats remain. So watch this space. Molly, I want to go back to what you said about uh, Stormy Daniels and the, the misogyny in the trial. It was very obvious they were they were doing what people call slut shaming her. Um, I, I don't think it worked. My, my watching of it said it didn't work, but what it did see, serve to do, including the part in which Stormy Daniels uh, brought up the discussion uh, about, about sex that didn't, as you say, need to be part of the trial, is it reminds people about who Donald Trump is. Um, uh, on the most charitable side, you could say he's a womanizer. He has also been somebody who has been uh, credibly uh, convicted of sexual assault. So... Uh, you know, this, that, that part of the story remains there for women who I think have a lot to think about in this election, particularly the fact that in half the country, their rights, their reproductive rights are gone. Yeah, it was a really stark moment, I thought, when we saw her up on the stand and we heard her talk about, you know, the, the way she recounts the story is not, does not sound very, I mean, it's just a very dark kind of story. And in the end, she says, you know, I took responsibility for this. It, what happened is, you know, on me. But but to have this lawyer on cross saying, you know, well, since you're a porn star, doesn't he just have the right to do whatever he wants? I'm sorry, but as a woman like, and as a feminist and as a mother and a daughter, I mean, it was just a pretty horrific scene. And, and the fact that Trump, the presidential nominee, is behind this, and we know he is because he has such a that kind of relationship with his lawyers. Uh, is in in my mind pretty dark. Yeah, and that will be a reminder to everybody about the way he thinks about these things. Thank you to you both. It is fantastic to see you. Hey, Molly, thank, extra thanks to you. We got to spend a little extra time on uh, Friday night in uh, New York. So thanks to uh, thanks to you for that.